So this is the, the uh, October 11th, 2021 meeting of the Yolo County Trans Transportation District Board of Directors. And we are meeting this evening pursuant to government code section 54956-1. Uh, this is an executive order signed by, the, by Governor Newsom that allows public agencies to conduct their meetings remotely uh, and, uh, and then, but we uh, have uh, set up opportunities for people to provide public comment uh, in written form, as well as uh, to test to provide testimony to us at key times during the agenda. Uh, on tonight's agenda, we also have on our I think it's on our consent agenda an update to this meeting protocol that is pursuant to the passage of legislation that was signed by the governor that allows us to continue under certain circumstances to meet remotely. So I'll call the, this meeting uh, to order. And I'd like to have um, Autumn, one of, your, one of your team call roll of the members of the board to determine our quorum. Let's see, do we have Kathy back? Looks like we do. Kathy, can you call the roll? You're on mute. City of Davis. I am here. City of West Sacramento. Here. City of Winters. Here. City of Woodland. Not yet here. Yolo County. Here. UC Davis. Here. Caltrans District 3. Here. We have a quorum. Wonderful, thank you. And next item on our agenda is approval of the agenda for this evening. Autumn, is there any change that you would suggest to the agenda or is it as you recommend? Mr. Chair, no changes to the agenda from staff. All right. I would move to approve tonight's agenda. Thank you. Is there a second? Second by Frerix. So we have a motion by Lauren and a second by Frerix to approve the agenda. So please call the roll. City of Davis. Hi. City of West Sacramento. Aye. City of Winters. Aye. City of Woodland. Yolo County. Aye. The motion passes. Thank you, Kathy. Next item is, come, is item three in our agenda. It's comments from the public regarding matters not on the agenda, but within the purview of this agency. And please note that out of that it, legally we're prohibited from discussing items that are not on the agenda. It's also not fair to people who uh, might not be here and have a topic come up that would interest them. So uh, Kathy, do we have anybody who's requested an opportunity to speak to us in public comment by raising their hand? I don't see anyone, do we? And we. We did have some written comments that were received prior to the meeting and were transmitted to the board. Uh, are there any other written comments? No, we've received nothing since then. All right, thank you very much. So that brings us to the consent calendar. Is there anyone who would like to remove anything from the consent calendar for further discussion? Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented? Moved by Ferrex. Is there a second? Seconded by Lauren. Very good. So we have a motion by Director Frerichs and a second by Director Lauren. Uh, would you please call the roll, Kathy, on the consent agenda items four, A, B, and C. City of Davis. Aye. City of West Sacramento. Aye. City of Winters. Aye. City of Woodland. Jose, I believe he's waiting out in the other area. Um, Yolo County. Aye. Thank you, the motion passes. All right, that brings us to item five, board member reports, announcements, other nominations, presentations. Does any member of the board have anything that you'd like to share for the good of the cause? I don't see anyone. That brings us to item six, 
uh, Yolo Go Phase Two public hearing. And uh, Autumn, is, is you're going to introduce this? Yeah, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen Major, who's going to walk us through. Uh, but just to quickly remind everyone, this is a continuation of the uh, public hearing that we had last board meeting, our last regular board meeting with regard to Yolo Go Phase Two, which is changes taking place in West Sacramento. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Kristen to, to talk about what's happened since last month. Okay, great. Thank you, Autumn, and good evening, everyone. I'm just going to mention to Jose right now, I eventually am going to want to share my screen if possible. Um, so if you can enable screen sharing, that would be great. Yeah, I'll make you a co-host. You should be able to when you get to there. Okay, great. So um, as Autumn said, this is a continuation of the public hearing that uh, was started at the September 13th board meeting. Um, I won't go over all of the proposed service changes in detail since we did that at that last September meeting. But in short, um, the service changes that you're considering tonight are all related to West Sacramento routes and include discontinuing routes 35 and 39 and replacing them with route 37, discontinuing route 241, and making minor adjustments to routes 40, 41, and 240. And those minor adjustments include restoring the early and late trips that were discontinued temporarily, temporarily due to COVID and um, modifying and streamlining the route path for those routes in downtown Sacramento. Um, so at your September 13th meeting, um, we received a lot of public testimony um, and in response to that, the board decided to keep the meeting open to give staff an additional month to um, consider the public comments and to discuss the comments with City of West Sacramento staff. So um, in September, we did review carefully the comments with West Sacramento staff and met with them to discuss whether any changes were needed. Um, in general, we all agreed that the proposed service changes, which were already based upon really robust public outreach and analysis that was done during YOLO GO, uh, the study process, that they were still valid and still the best path forward for West Sacramento. However, we did agree to make one change to the proposed routing of Route 37. So that's what I'm going to share with you right now. Um, let's see. Are you able to see the slide that I just pulled up here? Yes. OK, great. So um, specifically, a few commenters noted that because the northern end of Jefferson Boulevard um, doesn't have a lot of pedestrian infrastructure or really any pedestrian infrastructure on the eastern side of the street that it was going to require long walking distances to get to a safe bus stop in the northbound direction if we were to travel along Jefferson in this segment that I've highlighted in yellow. Um, so I'm going to zoom in on that segment and just show you what we are proposing to change. So um, after we talked with West Sacramento staff um, and discussed whether there were any alternatives in that segment, we decided to reroute the path um, rather than going along Jefferson Boulevard in that area. It would go along Stone and up Park. Um, we believe that that won't really slow down the vehicle that much. Um, the main reason for the changes is to streamline and speed up the bus. Um, but that segment of Jefferson actually becomes very congested during peak hours. So it's likely that it won't slow down the bus too much. Um, one thing that was probably slowing down the bus more was the fact that there were just so many stops along Stone and Park. So we're proposing to eliminate many of those excess stops and just streamline it down to key, key um, points along the route. So um, we actually went out in the field, um, YCTD and transit staff, and settled on the stop locations that you see reflected here, including Park at Stone, um, Park at 17th, and then adding new stops up on Park near Jefferson Boulevard. So I will stop sharing. Um, and with that, um, that concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, very, very clear. Uh, we'll uh, start with uh, Mr. Ledesma, if you have any questions regarding this, and uh, colleagues, then we'll turn after any board members' questions have been addressed, then we'll open the public hearing. Uh, start with Chris. Um, hey, hey uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. And I don't have any questions at this time, but we'll have a comment, but I'll wait till after the public hearing. All right, any, any questions from any member of the board? I don't see anyone raising a hand. 
or indicating a need to speak. So with that, uh, Hope will open the public hearing and imagine a gavel gently tapping a, a tabletop. The public hearing is now open. Is there anyone who'd like to address the board on these, on uh, the, the Go, YOLO Go Phase 2 matters presented? Uh, Kathy, do you see anyone who's indicating an interest to speak? So that I don't see anyone uh, stepping forward or raising a hand, so we'll I see nothing. close. What's that? I see nothing. Okay, thank you. So we'll close the public hearing. Uh, now we'll turn to the board for action on this matter. Uh, Chris, did you have something you'd like to express? And uh, Chris is having some uh, some uh, internet difficulties. So uh, we'll, uh, I believe that he had a comment he wanted to make. Uh, Chris, if you can hear us, uh, you can turn your video off and we'll be able to hear you probably. Maybe you'll come back on. Any other member of the board have any comments? Or let's see what uh, Mr. Ledesma is saying. Yeah, he's having a computer issue. So I, I uh, Kristen, I think you probably, have you spoken with Director Ledesma about this matter? I believe Autumn did. Okay. Yeah, I, I did sp speak with Director Ledesma uh, on Friday. Um, and uh, he said uh, he was pleased to hear about the progress and he wanted to review everything over the weekend. Um, so okay. uh, I, I can't tell you, <laughs> I'm not sure what he was planning to say, um, right. but he, well, he did sound pleased with the progress. I think what, we'll, what I'd like to suggest we do colleagues, I'd like to be sure that we hear from Mr. Ledesma on, on this matter since it's, it affects the rep community he represents. So why don't we move on to the next item Hopefully he'll be able to come back on and participate in that discussion. Does that make sense, Jesse? I, I, I texted him and he said, go ahead and vote on it. Okay, well that's okay. Well, okay, great. Thank you for Sorry, that. Uh, do you wanna make just, a motion then? I'd like to move the item. And Director Stallard, welcome aboard. I'd like to know what the item is because I'll vote on it if I know what it is. Sorry. Okay. It's, uh, I've had, Yolo, I've it's had item computer. six, Tom. It's Yolo Go phase two public hearing, and this is to approve the revised, uh, so some some very sensible revision that's been presented to us. And I'm happy, it, happy to you. second the item. For Eric's will second. So we have a motion on the floor and uh, or on the table. So Jesse uh, Loren has sec has made the motion. Frerichs has seconded. Uh, let's go ahead and call the roll. City of Davis. Aye. City of West Sacramento. City of Winters. Aye. City of Woodland. Aye. Nolo County. Aye. The motion passes. All right, thank you very much. That brings us to item seven, a presentation by Caltrans on the I-80 corridor improvements project. It's a project we've all been following very closely with, and we're, we're actually partners on this project uh, with Caltrans and have been participating, a couple of us been participating with their steering committee for, or seems like a long time. And we, and we have, uh, I think, no, Naweed, are you gonna be presenting this evening? Yes. And did, uh, Autumn, did you wanna make any opening comments? I would thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so just just by way of introduction, I want to yeah I want to welcome um, Nuit Nassar, who is the project manager for the 80 corridor improvements project for Caltrans. He's going to provide an update on the project since the board's last discussion back in March, when you were considering whether to put forward a federal grant application to fund the construction of the project. Of course, that grant application was successful, and in July, YCG learned that we'd receive 85 million in federal infrastructure infra grants for the funds for the project. YCDV has not yet received those funds, but I did have a conversation several weeks ago with the USDOT Office of Intergovernmental Affairs about the status of the award. We're likely still a few months out from signing an agreement with FHWA that would allow us to begin expending those funds. Um, however, Caltrans has been moving forward to design the project and move it through environmental review. Um, uh, I wanted to just flag as we get started, at the time of the infra grant application, there were a number of areas uh, where key planning decisions needed to be made, um, such as issues such as the nature and scope of bicycle improvements, strategies for prioritizing transit, 
um, the, the lane management strategy itself. In other words, whether or not this would be managed as a carpool lane, an express lane, a bus only lane, or some combination thereof. Um, and as we're getting really close to really, uh, environmental review for this project, Caltrans has begun to crystallize um, their preferred alternative. Um, and so I thought it was a good time to invite the board to hear an update from Caltrans, ask questions, share feedback, and provide staff with the, your direction on priorities as we work with Caltrans entering this critical phase. So with that, I will turn it over to Noeed to, to share his presentation. And if we made him a co-host, we have, looks like we have, great. Great, thank you very much, Don and Adam. I'll try to share my screen. Let me see if I share the right screen. It always goes back and forth. Again, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for giving us this opportunity to present. Again, my name is Naweed Nassar, and I am the Caltrans Project Manager for the Yolo 80 Corridor Improvement Project, which consists of the Managed Lane Project that we talked about. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for being here with us today, and uh, so that we can provide you guys an update of the Interstate 80 Corridor Improvement Project, the project's progress that's in Solano, Yolo, and Sacramento counties. The, Dep the California Department of Transportation and collaboration with a variety of stakeholders, including the Yolo County Transportation District, proposes to construct improvements consisting of managed lanes, pedestrian and bicycle facilities, and intelligent transportation system elements along Interstate 80 from Kidwell Road and Eastern Solano County through Yolo County and to West El Camino Avenue on Interstate 80 and along US 50 from the US 50 Interstate 80 separation to Interstate 5 in Sacramento County, which I will share a project location map with you guys here shortly. Part of the, part of the Caltrans project team is myself. The design team is Monica Pettigrew, the senior, and the project engineers are Joel, the crew, and Joey Morrison. Our headquarter environmental coordinator is Jennifer Lugo. Our transportation senior is Jazz Randawa, and our transportation engineers are Jonathan Ho and Satish Prakash. Our environmental senior is Julia Green. Our environmental coordinator is Masum Patwari, and our public information officer is Dennis Keaton, who will be helping us with this project, as well as the steering committee, the remainder of the project development team, and the public. During this presentation, we will be talking about the need and purpose of the project, different types of managed lane, some of the benefits managed lanes will provide, some of the alternatives that we're considering analyzing as part of the environmental documentation, <coughs> the project limits and scope, as well as um, giving you guys an update on the current project funding, as well as the current schedule. I'll be talking about the need and purpose of the project next. This project is needed because of the rear current congestion during the morning and evening peak periods, which exceed the current design capacity, limiting personal throughput, and operational insufficiencies that leads to formation of bottlenecks due to short weaving and merging areas, as well as lane drop. Furthermore, this project is needed because of insufficient movements of goods and services, which impedes regional and interstate economic sustainability. The corridor users rely heavily on signal occupancy vehicles, which limit multimodal options such as transit, carpool, bicycle, and pedestrian facilities, re resulting in unreliable travel times. And the lack of real-time travel, travel information and coordinated traffic communication system, which impedes timely responses to the roadway incidents, resulting in secondary collisions and increased non reoccurring congestion. And the purpose of this project is to improve mobility by easing congestion and improving overall person throughput, to improve freeway mainline, ramp, and system ramp interchange operations, to support reliable transportation of goods and services throughout the region by improving modality and travel time re reliability for all users, including transits, and addressing non-reoccurring congestion. And finally, to provide an expedited travel time information and monitoring system through intelligent transportation system 
network elements. I wanted to discuss, <clears throat> kind of go over the different types of managed lane because from here on we'll be considered, we'll be talking about the project as a managed lane. So the first type of a managed lane, which we're used to during in the Sacramento region is the high occupancy vehicle lane or bus carpool lane, which allows and restricts access to certain vehicles. For instance, two or more vehicles can, can access that, via, uh, that lane. The next, part, the next one is high occupancy toll lane, which is free access to vehicles that meets the minimum occupancy requirements, which we two plus or three plus people per, per vehicle. And that lane is priced access to vehicles that do not mean to meet the minimum occupancy requirement, which would be the single occupancy vehicles. Another type of a managed lane is an express lane where all users pay a toll to access this lane. And a discount can potentially be given to certain vehicle types like carpool, which would be your two plus or three plus people per vehicle. And lastly, another type of a managed lane would be a transit only lane where only transits can exit that lane. So <clears throat> what are the benefits of managed lanes? Some of the, the managed lanes are designed to keep the vehicle speeds at or above 45 miles an hour. Normally or initially they're designed as a high occupancy vehicle lanes and variable <coughs> pricing or different types of pricing, which is HOT and express lanes are implemented to maintain the 45 mile an hour speed. Managed lanes provides a more reliable travel times for all users, including transits, and improves the general purpose lane operations. Some of the other benefits of the managed lanes are be, they move more, uh, more people than general purpose lanes. And minimum re um, occupancy requirement is required for, you know, for those lanes, which leads to more reliable travel times, helps lower emission vehicle, uh, lower vehicle emissions, and drivers can save money. So as far as the alternatives that are being analyzed are the no-built alternatives, meaning that we will continue to maintain the existing three general purpose lanes in each direction, constructing a managed lane in the median, and that managed lane that we're gonna construct, it can be a HOV lane, HOT lane, an express lane, or a transit only lane, and the third option we're looking at, alternative that we're looking at, is converting the existing number one lane to a managed lane, which would yield two general purpose lanes and one managed lane. So next, I will talk to, <clears throat> to you guys about the project limits and different segments of the projects. As I mentioned earlier, the project is on Interstate 80 from Kedrigal Road to West El Camino Avenue on Interstate 80 and on US 50 from Interstate 80 West 50 Junction to 50 and Interstate 5 Junction. And the purpose of the project is to construct managed lane, intelligent transportation system animal elements like changeable message signs, closed circuit televisions, and ramp metering, pedestrian bicycle improvement, signing and strapping improvements. Sec the project is Sega separated into different segment due to its geography, location, and other and some constraint. The first segment, which is segment 1A, is from Kidwell Road to Solano Yolo County line. And in this segment, we're proposing to construct intelligent transportation system elements and modifying the eastbound Interstate 80 striping between Old Davis Road and Richards Boulevard for an, for an auxiliary lane. And the cross section will be as you see on the top left. We are not proposing to add or construct managed lanes within this segment. Segment 1B is from the Yolo Solana County line to just west of the Yolo Causeway. As shown on your left, the top one is the existing cross section, and the bottom one is the uh, proposed cross section. Both eastbound and westbound will look similar. And this segment, we're proposing to construct managed lanes in the median. Constructing and improving the ramp metering systems and constructing intelligent transportation system element, as well as constructing a new ped and bicycle path. The new ped, uh, bicycle path, <coughs> the idea is 
to construct a new bike facility from the existing Western Yolo Causeway pedestrian bicycle path terminus or the 90 degree turn along the westbound Interstate 80 and East Childs Road, County Road 32 off ramp to County Road 32A as shown in the center of your screen. With this new alignment, the pedestrian bicycle facility, the eastbound bicyclists or pedestrians will be able to make a right turn onto the new path without having to cross the existing crossing, the existing curved crossing on northeastern portion of County Road 32A. The westbound users, bicyclists and pedestrians will be able to use the existing path along the levee and back to County Road 32A without having to cross County Road 32A. This was proposed in coordination with the Yolo County as well as some of the bicycle advocates and comments from the public. Segment 1C is on the Yolo Causeway. As shown on the top left is the existing and the bottom is the proposed. Within this segment, we are proposing to strike for an additional lane for managed lane. Constructing intelligent transportation system elements, modifying the existing pedestrian bicycle facilities and resurfacing, and improving the concrete barrier separation between the existing class one bike path and the, and the, the travel lane. The existing barrier between the bike path and the travel lane is a 32 inch barrier, concrete barrier with a fence on top of it. We're proposing to uh, remove and reconstruct that to a 42 inch and potentially a 56 inch barrier that will provide a little bit more noise barrier and a more comf comfortable ride experience for the users. As part of the project, we also studied a separated pedestrian bicycle bridge just north of the existing cause, uh, causeway. That pedestrian bike path would be approximately 150 feet north of the existing causeway to reduce some of the noise impacts and other um, impacts from the, um, from the freeway. And based on initial study, we also did, did some environmental study as well. So constructing a new bike path, which would be approximately 18 to 24 inch wide across the Yolo Causeway will have a big impact on the existing environmentally rich and sensitive Yolo Causeway as home and habitat to many species of animals and plants. We will need extensive coordination with United States Corps of Engineers and the Central Valley Flood Protection Board and is projected to have high construction costs. The project development team conducted the weekday and weekend counts for pedestrian and bicycle users and the environmental and cost impact of constructing a new pipe path is far greater than the project benefits or the projected benefits. All this information will be documented in the environmental document that will be released for public review in winter 2022. Segment two is from the east of the Yellow Causeway to West El Camino Avenue on Interstate 80. As shown on the top uh, left of, your, of the cross section is existing and we're proposing to construct a managed lane in the median. Constructing and improving ramp metering, intelligence transportation system element. We're also proposing to construct a new park and ride in the city of West Sacramento at the eastbound Interstate 80 and Enterprise Boulevard off-ramp. The new uh, park and ride facility will accommodate up to 300 vehicles, as well as a bus stop or bus transfer station for Yolo bus or, um, um, you know, SACRT for people, for folks to drop in and out. We're going to try to implement as many uh, other uh, elements in this park and ride facility as we can, including charging station or even fast charging station uh, for, for this to be more um, accommodating to folks who wants to park their vehicles and move or change your mode from a single occupancy to a bus. But in this segment, we're also studying a, mat, a flyover at the 8050 junction. The idea of the flyover is to have a streamlined or a seamless um, 
HOV or managed link connection within the Sacramento region. Meaning that folks who are on, uh, on Interstate 80 will stay on that managed lane if they want to continue on Interstate 80 without having to merge all the way to the right to exit the freeway. And that flyover will also be documented as part of one of the alternatives that's being studied in the, in the environmental document. Segment 3A is from Interstate 80 US 50 Junction to Jefferson Boulevard. In this segment, we are proposing to con convert an existing lane to a managed lane, improving ramp metering, implementing and constructing intelligent, intelligent transportation system elements, modifying the westbound Interstate 80 striping between Jefferson Boulevard and Harbor Boulevard front auxiliary lane. And lastly, segment 3B is from Jefferson Boulevard to use 50 Interstate, uh, Interstate 5 Junction. In this segment, over the Pioneer Bridge, we're proposing to restripe for an additional managed lane and constructing intelligent transportation system elements. So the current project cost, depending on which alternative is being selected through the environmental documentation, is anywhere from $100 million to $600 million. And we are anticipating releasing the draft environmental document for public review in winter of 2021-22 or uh, winter of 2021-22. And finalizing the environmental document by spring of 2022. As of now, a preferred alternative has not been selected, meaning that we have not selected whether we're going to construct an HOV lane, HOT lane, an express lane, or a transit only lane. But the way we're moving forward and the way we're preparing the environmental document, we're going to clear all, the, all of the alternatives. And some of the preliminary innovative design that we're doing, we're going to design it so that, you know, um, so that modifying it from an HOV lane to HOT lane or HOT lane to express lane, we're not going to be doing a lot of more reconstruction. It's just how we're going to manage that lane with additional signage and different type of striping. So going through the environmental process, we anticipate a preferred alternative will be selected as part of the final environmental document, which is targeted uh, for completion by spring of 2022. After the environmental clearance, we're gonna start on the design. We're currently anticipating design to be complete by spring of 2024 and starting construction by spring of 2025. One thing that we're trying to do is accelerating the project. So instead of the completing the design in spring of 2024, we're, look, we're working with the team. We're trying to combine this team with a pavement rehabilitation project, uh, which is just from just east of Mace Boulevard to the Yolo and Sacramento County line, and trying to see if we can combine the two projects during construction. Both projects will have different environmental documentation, different design, but we'll try to combine them in construction because there will be some benefits, cost-saving benefits for uh, mobilization, traffic handling, those and impacts to public during construction if we were to combine them. Um, right now, um, even though we have not requested for official comments from the public because we haven't circulated an environmental document, public can submit their comments to yo 80 corridor at dot.ca.gov. We have a email set up for it. We, we are taking public input and comment and responding it, and responding to them adequately or in the environmental document. They can also call the one the our environmental coordinator, Masun Patwari, at 530-812-7634, leave a voicemail to voice their concern. And if anybody would like more updated information on the, on the project progress, we do have a website set up, which you see on your screen. And this is our regular District 3 project website where we have a list of all the projects in District 3. And this is the I-80 corridor improvements projects. That concludes my presentation as far as giving, providing a quick update of the project progress uh, funding and schedule. 
One thing I forgot to uh, mention about the funding, um, Adam Bernstein did mention about the funding so far, we have secured $8 million through SACOG for the project environmental document phase of the project. So we have enough funding to complete the environmental document. The $85.9 million that we received from INFRA grant will assist with the project, but we are still a little bit short to complete the project. So the project development team, uh, stakeholder, I mean, even our partners, steering committee and other agencies, we're trying to look for uh, additional funding through competitive um, funding. With that have said, that concludes my, uh, my presentation. I will open it for discussion. Very good. Autumn, do you want to have any, any uh, comments before we begin board discussion? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, no comments from me at this time, other than maybe I might ask Mr. Nassar to uh, stop sharing his screen. So we can see each other. Indeed. Thank you. So what I take away from the presentation is that there are a number of decisions that have yet to be made, that there is an environmental process underway, that, that the alternatives that, will, that are being addressed in the environmental process include uh, what the nature of the managed lane uh, configuration will be, uh, whether it's three or two lanes of, on, of uh, standard tra uh, traffic east and westbound, what the bicycle access and infrastructure and improvements might be, uh, as well as the, the flyover uh, aspect of the, of the connection at 50 and 80, and then, uh, and then other aspects of the project uh, that, are, that are a part of the a part of all of the different alternatives. So those decisions, I assume you're saying, and will be made after the environmental review is completed. That's a correct? Yes. Okay. Well, with, with that, I think we, we may have some members of the public who'd like to address us. Uh, we are, uh, as, as, as the applicant for funding for the Infra Project, we do have a unique partnership here and we've had ongoing conversations. After maybe we'll hear a little bit of board uh, member uh, questions and uh, maybe just uh, just questions at the moment you know, for clarification. Then we'll turn to uh, the public comment and then come back to board discussion. And Mr. Frerix, you're a member of the steering committee, I believe. Would you like? Do you have any questions that haven't been raised in the in the presentation to this point? Thanks uh, very much, Mr. Chair. Just would, um, uh, I know we'd appreciate your presentation this evening, and I know that see Sue's on the call as well. So thanks so much for her joining us as well. I think um, the a couple quick questions. One, I do feel fortunate to have been you know part of the steering committee since it was sort of initially created about three or four years ago now, and we've seen us uh, you know the infra grant was applied for several times before it was successful, but uh, for I think questions, you know, I, Don just asked this specific question that, you know, when will a decision be made with regard to a sort of the, the managed lane uh, versus, you know, a HOV lane versus a hot lane versus something, you know, potentially else. I, I want more detail if possible around the decision itself on that. I mean, there are other agencies that have contributed dollars. You referenced SACOG previously. Um, there's probably likely going to be other agencies that have to contribute to make up the the final um, balance of the proposed project. So really curious about the details around who, who makes the decision and how is the decision actually made with regard to what the proposed managed lane consists of, if it is ultimately a high occupancy vehicle lane versus a high occupancy toll lane. Um, appreciate hearing about that. That's the first one. Um, and then Two, uh, two other quick questions, I think. One, uh, th this concept of a flyover lane, I'm certainly well aware of what they are. Um, this is the first I I've heard of a flyover lane for this particular project uh, in the now three or four years that we've been involved in this process. Um, I may have missed a meeting of the steering committee, I guess, somewhere along the way where it was discussed, but um, I've never heard of the, the use of the cons or construction of flyover lanes for this particular project. Um, so would really appreciate hearing more about that and where that came from. Um, and then 
uh, actually two, two last really quick things. One on the, on slide 10, which was the uh, proposed bike uh, pro pedestrian enhancements on the west side of the causeway that, uh, that sort of the new ramp that will follow the off ramp. Um, I have to assume that not all westbound users are going to use the existing path, uh, but will will use the newly constructed facility. So curious about um, how westbound bike and ped users will make across road 32A safely um, at the, once they reach the end of the newly constructed sort of bike off ramp, and then. Naweed, last thing is you um, mentioned at the very end of your presentation, uh, I didn't catch what the name of the project was. You said, I think you said a second project. So I think I heard you say Mace Boulevard to the Sac County line. And that, that would, that, that may be additionally incorporated into the pro into the initial project. I just didn't catch that, the sort of the, what the name of it was. So anyway, so appreciate you indulging me just asking those a variety of questions and thanks very much and appreciate again your um, willingness to participate this evening and give us all an update yeah, as a partner and the I, partner I tried to, yeah no i tried to take notes on some of your questions forgive me if i misunderstand I'm, i misunderstood so the first question you had was uh, regarding the alternative selection as i mentioned that we're going to go through the environmental process to, to see which alternative will be selected before the the alternative the selection of alternative will be based on an environmental documentation phase, input from the public, coordination with the steering committee, as well as PDT. So it's not gonna be something that, you know, whatever alternative that's being selected, we'll vet it through public steering committee that uh, most of you are involved in, as well as the project development team. So that's how we're gonna select the alternative. And obviously that whatever alternative that we select will be tied to funding. So we can only approve an alternative that we have funding for. Uh, don't quote me on that one. But um, like I mentioned, the funding is going to dictate which component of the project we'll be able to add. When I say add, uh, the flyover is one of the additions. If we have funding for the flyover, we do have cost system that impacts to right away utilities and stuff like that. If we have that funding, we can implement that. If you have funding for HOT lanes, that's another thing. So each one of those has a different cost. So that's how the alternative will be selected. As far as the flyover lane, when it was considered, the flyover is part of the overall Sacramento region uh, managed lane, um, managed lane um, idea or concept. So that folks, if they're on 50, they will stay on, they will stay on a managed lane through Yolo County and then when they get to I-5, that's when they, they're going to connect to the existing construction project that's going to terminate at I-5. So people who are going to be on, uh, on 50 will remain on 50 without having to merge over to the right. And as part of, as part of the Sac greater Sacramento region, people who are on 80 can stay on, on the managed lane on 80 and continue on 80 and go towards 80 across the top. So that's how the flyover was considered. And that was considered all the way back through the project inception and the planning stage uh, when the uh, P PSR and PDS was prepared. So that was that. As far as the pedestrian enhancement, and uh, like you mentioned, not all users will use the new path. I mean, not all westbound paths will, will use the existing path. And some users may continue on the path to come all the way to County Road 32A. So the pet and bike path is going to be bi-directional. We're going to sign and encourage people to use the existing path so they don't have to cross the county of 32A. But once they come to that crossing, uh, we're, we're coordinating with the project development team, Yolo County, as far as what type of features to include at that crossing for safe crossing. So uh, we, we looked into various different alternatives. Do we want to ret rectangle the fashion beacon and has crosswalk? All that stuff is being considered. And uh, we're going to get input from the county because that's going to be in the county right away, as well as project development team and those folks as far as, you know, to still uh, allow people to make that crossing if they choose to. So that's uh, uh, answer to question number three. The uh, question number four that you had as far as the payment rehabilitation project, uh, that project, the project environmental document was approved in February of 2021, which was about, you know, eight months ago. That project is 
about a, about a year and a half, two years ahead of this project. So this project, the pavement rehabilitation project is to preserve and maintain the existing pavement from on, on Interstate 80, just east of Mace Boulevard, all the way to the county line and on 50 between the 5080 interchange to Interstate 5. Great, thank you so much for all those. And I have, maybe have some comments a little later on, but thank you for the answers to all those questions. Appreciate it. Thank you. Lauren, do you have uh, questions at this point? I, I do. Um, I'll go after Tom. Okay. Tom, thank you. Oh, I just had a, thank you, <laughs> Jesse. I had a quick one. Uh, this project then incorporates none of the lane reductions that happen west of Davis. I didn't hear you mention yeah, so anything about those. Yeah, we have. There's always a jam up there when you go from five lanes to three lanes uh, between the university and the downtown exit. Right. So that portion of the project is in Solano County line. One thing that we are doing is constructing or restriping for that auxiliary lane between um, Richards Boulevard and uh, the on ramp at Old Davis Road. So mm -hmm. that's going to help a little bit. But as far as adding or constructing additional lane within, within the Solano County line, um, construction of an additional lane is not part of the regional transportation plan. So Solano County, we've been coordinating with them and um, maybe there will be something that they're gonna consider implementing in the future, but currently and within the Solano County, which is outside of Yolo County, they're not planning on constructing additional lane in that segment, but we will be implementing ITS elements at on and off ramps, which is ramp metering and other features uh, that normally does help with um, mainline operations. It would, it would seem like it would be a missed opportunity not to do something in that area. It's a consistent bottleneck. So I just, you know, and I can imagine that San Lano County doesn't care about it because it's on the way out of their county, you know, whereas it's in two hours and uh, very difficult. So there's I, a, I, I'll there's let other. A, I'm sorry, Tom, there's a, I think Sue is on the line as well. Either Nas, Nas, Navid or Sue might want to, now we might, might want to mention the larger corridor uh, review that's underway that does include a look at that, uh, that little bottleneck there. And that bottleneck is actually a fairly significant one that you're pointing out, Tom. And that mm -hmm. is uh, that is one of those interesting things that involves a, a bigger solution than the folks before us right now can do by themselves. So we're there's another uh, integrated corridor planning process that's underway that Definitely. does address that. Definitely, Don. Um, this is um, Sue Tacker, Chairman Sailor. And thank you for that. I think you have been participating in all of our meetings, so you know this much much better than I do even now. So, but this comprehensive multimodal corridor plans are addressing the long-term need that um, Supervisor Sailor mentioned. And um, those plans are close to wrap, being wrapped up. We will be wrapping them up toward the winter of 2021, early 2022. And they will study that we are partners with District 4 in the um, Oakland office. And that is our goal is to be uniform. Um, we keep saying that public doesn't know where, where District 3 ends and District 4 starts. We want one system for all users. And so that is our hope with this comprehensive multimodal corridor plan is to get all that feedback. And we've gotten this feedback in different forms and address it with our partners um, in Oakland and also work with them on their metropolitan transportation plans to to find ways to put projects in that would make that a seamless transportation system. And while it falls out of outside the boundaries of the project we're talking about tonight, it is on the table. Correct. Okay. Uh, Director Stallard, any, anything else? Uh, well, I first of all, I thought it was an outstanding presentation, uh, very nicely described in segments. Uh, I have a feeling it's one of those presentations where I need to hear it again another time uh, so that I can so I can get some of that really uh, really settling in. I, I also uh, wondered, I've often thought that was a nasty bikeway uh, up there at grade with the traffic lanes. I mean, I did it once. It was awful uh, and I wouldn't care to do it again. I'd wondered about uh, putting the uh, 
bikeway really on the ground. Uh, you know, we do have times when there actually has been water in the bypass, but it, it's usually uh, ephemeral for a brief period of time. And uh, a bike path at grade, I think, would be a really nice way to separate it. It would certainly dramatically reduce costs. So I wonder if that's been considered as one of the options in the analysis that's being done. That, uh, that is the flood zone. That is the causeway which gets flooded. So I'm not sure if it's, um, we can definitely try to take a look into that. But if that um, facility is flooded and it's in the bypass, and as, as it is now, even putting a foundation for a footing foundation for a signpost is very difficult to touch those wetlands and wetland area because it's a wildlife, it is a causeway and to construct a whole new 20, and it's not gonna be a, our typical, you know, 10 foot or 12 foot wide facility input from the public is that they want a wider facility, 24 to 20, 20 to 18 to 24 foot wide facility, which would be the size of a residential street to construct that across the environmentally rich causeway, um, that would be very challenging. But that's something we can take a look at and uh, see what it takes. Even a board a boardwalk, uh, you know, ha would cost a whole lot less than an elevated cement bridge. Uh, so I just feel like I I'm a, and I'm a bike rider. I'm sympathetic to bike uh, opportunities. Uh, I think you could do something that's a whole lot less expensive than an elevated cement bridge. That would be quite acceptable. Okay, thank you. That's all for me, Don. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Chris, you've got your hand, your hand up. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Jesse went first, so I'll let, I'll let her to go first. She had called her. I've completely lost control. <laughs> yes, you have. She, you called her next, so I'll, I'll all let right. her go. Well, it's, I all right. if she wanted to talk or not. <laughs> I, well, I was still thinking about it. I was still listening to discussion, but um, Nawid, thank you, Nawid. Thank you for your presentation. I'm really glad that you're here. I'm really glad that we're having uh, conversations on this. Um, and uh, I just, I wanted to start out at about, I don't know, 10,000 feet or higher on the uh, presentation, just starting with the list that's the need and purpose list. Um, when I look at the need and purpose list, um, it doesn't seem to prioritize a vehicle, reduction of vehicle miles travel or address any uh, climate change. And yet, you know, we are where we are. Um, it doesn't seem to prioritize uh, the ease of use for mass transit in a meaningful way. It doesn't appear to have an equity lens uh, built into the process. And I'd like to talk about that, but um, it just doesn't seem to prioritize other um, methods of transportation such as bike ridership. And I do wanna say that uh, Tom's comments are, are well noted. Even, even an elevated boardwalk um, would be something that, that would um, really help uh, riders. Um, so as far as equity uh, questions go, um, to me, um, we should be asking, is this the best use of resources for all demographics of our community of riders? We should be asking, will the decision be safety neutral um, when we entertain decisions of safety, whose safety are we protecting most and whose safety will be reduced? And I think the safety of bicycle riders um, needs to be prioritized. Um, and lastly, does the action undermine or strengthen um, our, our mission and our values? And um, for the last couple of years, I've been um, listening to Chris Ledesma and other people on this board um, hammer in our um, vision and values. And uh, to me, uh, you know, I just want to mention as partners that, you know, uh, ec equity and uh, multimodal is very important to us. And, and then to, and then to just get more from 10,000 feet to specifics, um, just three things. Um, Cal, you're proposing to manage the new lanes as carpool lanes rather than um, HOV lanes or eight, uh, hot lanes. And I was, I prefer the HOT lanes, um, basically um, collecting tolls from drivers who are willing to pay and reallocating those funds to transit is widely considered a best practice in making our freeways more equitable. And from that equity value set, you know, I, I heard you say 
that you would you could make them and it would be flexible depending on the signage. And I would just want to make sure that um, that it is that flexible and that we prioritize the, the hot lanes. My second one is, yeah, I, I, I was board chair um, last go around before the great um, Don Saylor became our chair. And I don't remember ever hearing um, that flyover lanes were discussed in the infra grant. Um, they're gonna cost a lot of money. And I would just really value um, looking at equity and what the costs are. Um, for bike improvements, the infra grant promised a substantial investment in new active transportation, including analyzing the possibility of an entirely new separate bike route for Yolo Bypass. Um, I think many, all of us have mentioned that, but um, as it stands, it would still require cyclists to ride on road 32. I believe it's 32A and it does not address the dangerous railroad crossing. So um, bike lanes, flyover lane, um, HOT over HOV. Um, I just hope that the next iteration of the project includes the um, high occupancy toll lanes and really um, looks at how we spend our funding to address uh, equity amongst our, um, our ridership, bike, ped, car, and especially the buses. Thank, thanks, Jesse. Uh, no, we, I think those were mostly comments. I don't know if you if you have questions, but I think you've noted the comments for just further discussion in the steering committee. Definitely. Uh, Thank you, Jesse, for all that input. As you were typing, I was jotting down all the information that you're providing. Uh, we will definitely consider your comments when we go through the when you proceed with the project. And now we'd I'd happy to um, send an email or anything or. Um, you know, this is, to me, um, you know, these, these projects are um, value statements and what are our values as we move uh, forward for the, in the future? And um, I just want to make sure that we're all doing the right thing. Thank you. And we will have an opportunity as a board to provide you know, agency input as well. So I think that when it comes uh, comes time to participate in the review of the EIR, we'll have an opportunity there, but we'll have multiple opportunities in the steering committee meetings that are happening. And I think Autumn is taking note as well of individual board members' concerns and questions. Uh, Director Ledesma, your video is out, but I think you're there to make some comments or questions. Yeah, yeah, and forgive me for uh, bad video. Um, internet connection tonight. Um, but I do have some questions. Thanks for the uh, the feedback and the, and the presentation today and an update on this. I, um, I, a lot of my colleagues have said a lot of things that are on my mind about this project. I think um, uh, um, board member Lauren had, a, had one of them, which is about the values we go forward with them, which is kind of came to my mind. I understand the nature of the project. I understand that Caltrans is is looking at the project and trying to fit it in within the uh, within a kind of keep cost uh, front of mind and so that we can get it done and also looking at it from a perspective of um, trying to get it done quickly um, I think is what I seem to understand um, but what I would suggest is is that getting closer with the uh I, as, as we go through it closer with the cities closer with the county um there's some really big parts of this um project that were really important to us to begin with and one of them was the bike uh component and i appreciate my colleagues bringing that up that was a huge component in fact i know uh, board member ferrix uh, bringing this up when we started looking at it and we that got harder and harder as part of the part of the cell for the grant uh, but it's still in the logo <laughs> um, and um, and it's still a very much part of it I, I, I'm just going to say this that part of our values are, here is is around 
adjusting for climate change and making the necessary improvements to infrastructure. And we can't ask the public to, and it may not be with this project, but we can't ask the public or, or have alternatives for alternative transit or mobility uh, options if we don't have good infrastructure. And um, I just implore uh, going forward, you follow uh, some of the suggestions that were raised here um, about other ways to look at a, a, a bikeway, an improved bikeway. Um, I think with the advent of all of our transit um, and, and electric bike technology that's out there now, uh, these, these sorts of modes will be plausible at some point, but they won't be if we don't have uh, uh, the infrastructure to support them. I also think about that in terms of uh, thinking, working with the cities on how these land in their cities. So you mentioned two important pieces of this project that, that are in West Sacramento, that will be in West Sacramento. One of them is the flyover. Um, I understand the nature of it. Um, I I'm, don't quite recall how it would fly over or seeing the design as the alternative, but that is a piece of a uh, huge visible infrastructure that will be in our city uh, flying over uh, to connect um, uh, car traffic to uh, I-80 or 50, whichever the case it, it does. So I think it's just a, a piece that part of our value system is making sure we're connected. We understand the possible impacts of that piece of infrastructure because that, that will invariably take up uh, space. I'm not saying I'm opposed to it, but I think it's as we consider it as a viable part of this project, it will need to be close coordination. And finally is to connect with us on the other parts of the infrastructure to make it a better option. So you mentioned, you know, how can we get better connect to the existing parking rides or whatever else. So if people were to use, want to use transit or, or, or a bus system to leave uh, across the causeway down 80, I think, you know, we are, in, at least in West Sacramento, moving forward on the idea of, of, of uh, uh, mobility hubs, of, of uh, the use of our micro transit, which some of our, our, our sister cities in, in Yellow County are thinking about. But I, I think these are all options that we need to think about. I, again, I, I only bring, bring it up in terms of, of these need to be considerations. I, we, we're going to have a strong balance between getting this done getting it done within a budget we have. But I would also ask Caltrans to think about it with our with the agencies involved and the YCDD most importantly, with an eye towards the future. Um, if things go um, a certain way in, in, in our federal government, things like more a better bike uh, infrastructure projects that accentuate that sort of, of, of amenities and infrastructure for bike other mobility may become more competitive overnight. So um, again, these are things that I'm just kind of providing feedback on. These are important parts of the project. I just don't want to see get lost as we just, just sort of quickly try to move towards um, implementation and, and a project start in 2025, I think it's it. So I just had those comments tonight, Mr. Chair. Thank you for, for the time. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Matt Dulcich, did you have any comments that you'd like to make? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Don. And thank you to um, Caltrans. I think it's super exciting to see the progress on this. I um, was looking just a year, year and a half ago and seeing that in SACOG's plans, this was a 2036 project or <laughs> beyond 2036. So it's great to see um, this project getting more attention and moving on quickly. So thank you for that. I did... Um, really enjoy one of your first slides talked about the benefits of the managed lanes. And I think maybe from the YCTD perspective, adding that uh, managed lanes kind of encourages use of transit because it really allows the user to progress quickly and even encourages the managed lanes encourage investment in transit because decision makers know those buses will be moving, they will be going faster than traffic. And that's really what is going to also attract those riders. So that might be an item mm -hmm. to add as a benefit. Um, as a question, a detail is that situation in the planning that would be west of Richards or west of Mace and whether there's a ability, I think you said the managed lanes would start on the causeway or um, east of the causeway. And I'm wondering if the managed lanes could go all the way 
to um, Old Davis Road, um, knowing that the managed lanes are the real benefit of the project, could they be extended? And could that be part of the environmental review that's coming up? Yeah, like I mentioned before, that portion, that portion of the project limit is outside of the Yolo County line, that's in Solano County line. And we have been coordinating with them as far as what it takes to construct a managed lane within, you know, Solano County line, which would take it from Old Davis Road all the way to Kidwell Road. But because it's not in their current regional transportation plan, uh, it's a little bit difficult for them to program that in or construct something that's not in their regional transportation plan. I think Matt, Matt was talking about from Old Davis Road going to the east, if I understood it. Yeah, or, or at least um, maybe it would start at um, Solano yeah, old, old, yeah, old Davis Road or where the Yolo County line starts um, is the yeah, question. We, we are our uh, we are constructing managed lane at the county line. So oh, it at, is. Oh, okay. At the county line is where we are starting the managed lanes. Okay, I did not understand that. That's yes. that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you but that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. And uh, Mr. Stallard and Mr. Frerich, you both have your hands up. I don't know if you intended that or not. And Lucas, nope. did, did you have your hand up again for? I did, yeah, just a couple of really quick things. I just wanted to, um, I, I think um, for, uh, I'm not sure Naweed knows this yet and, and Sue may not know it either, but uh, you know, the work that's being done um, in the mega region sort of working group that is the, you know, MTC, uh, SACOG and uh, San Joaquin Council of Governments, uh, you know, has just, um, the three agencies just approved a, a list of approximately 10 to 12 projects that are sort of across the entire sort of greater Northern California Mag region. And this project is one of them. And so one of the keys uh, to this, of course, in terms of success is the, not just the um, MPOs, the Metropolitan Planning Organizations working together, but frankly, the different uh, Caltrans districts <laughs> working together. Uh, but I think the point is also the business community is very supportive of this project, uh, especially due to the goods movement aspect, but also the moving of people, especially as it relates to housing and jobs from between the Sacramento region and the Bay Area, especially. Um, I think, uh, you know, we need to have the SACOG folks be in touch with District 3 folks to sort of provide you all an update with uh, sort of how this project is, I mean, I think uh, across Northern California now becoming a, sort of a key top priority project. And so I, I think, you know, um, I recognize that uh, this project is not part of the currently existing um, RTP for the Bay Area, uh, but it is uh, being recognized as an essential project lifeline between the two regions. So hopefully the coordination between District 3 and District 10 uh, can also, uh, uh, you know, sort of be, is it district, uh, district 10 or District 4, my apologies, um, but can be sort of increased to make sure that we are, um, uh, you know, figuring out how to or sort of overcome this hurdle. I mean, you know, <laughs> there, there we're, you know, in this weird spot where we have the bottleneck every day is between Solano County and Yolo County line, which happens to be right in front of UC Davis. And so, uh, you know, I think trying to figure out some sort of solution there that involves fixing, making that fix uh, just, a, you know, a mile or so to the West uh, is pretty important for the success of the overall project. And then lastly, and I think it's an important one, is just that, you know, this is, we're, we're, we're the last major of the four major metro areas in California to not be using hot lanes, right? I mean, San Diego, Los Angeles, the Bay Area, hot lanes are being used. They generate revenue to, to, to add additional improvements uh, to provide uh, you know, additional opportunities for increased transit. Um, I mean, Director Lauren raised her comments, or I think it was, it seemed like it was actually a question. <laughs> I heard a question in there, especially around the question of equity. And I didn't hear an answer to that. And I understand that there's gonna be some uh, maybe follow up around that, but it, it does seem like, you know, the way that we're going to, there's going to be a one shot at doing a project like this in the next 50 years on this segment and to have it be a, an HOV lane, it does not make any sense um, from where, where we're going. That, that's, that's a project from 30 years ago or 20 years ago. 
but uh, moving forward into the well into the 21st century, we're going to need um, new tools in the in the toolkit. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I think as far as I'm concerned, the only choice is a high occupancy toll lane, uh, and in, with allowed transit usage in that same lane. So um, that's my own opinion, of course, but would definitely, uh, you know, we'll be continuing to be very involved in this process in the next couple of years, uh, and looking forward to the um, release of the environmental document and such, and and uh, looking forward to continuing to advocate for this project in the mega region, but also at SACOG. So um, thanks for the opportunity to make a few additional comments. Appreciate it. Thank you. And Jesse, you have your hand up, and then uh, then we'll see if there's any public comment after after that. I just wanted to thank Lucas and for recognizing that. Um, I hope that the equity questions come back. Um, sometimes uh, big agencies that make big decisions trade um, the value of one group for another. And I'd like to just raise some equity questions where we um, respect uh, all groups and don't take away from one in order to provide for another. And if we do it, we do it um, publicly and own it. Thanks. Okay. All right. Very good. I'll, I'll see if there's any members of the public who'd like to address us on this topic. And this is not an item for decision. So this is, uh, we, uh, we're not going to be taking motions this evening. This was an informational briefing. Are there any public comments on this topic before we conclude this conversation? We do not have any uh, requests at this time from the public. Chair okay. Very good. Well, thank you. This has been a robust conversation. And uh, Sue and Naweed, thank you so much for joining us this evening and sharing this information. It's good to be able to get sort of touch points on where this is, how this is unfolding. I appreciate uh, as much as anything the timeline to see where you're at. Matt has pointed out pretty well the, the, uh, your, your ability to move things forward. I know that the entire team at District 3 is focused on this project to get it moving forward. And we've got wide level of widespread support for improvements in this corridor. I think one of the, one of the ways of addressing some of the equity issues is to make, the, make, make a more streamlined access to transit that's reliable, efficient, comfortable, and safe. Uh, and that's one of the, one of the I think, uh, aspects of this project that's appealing. Another, frankly, is that we're not, uh, at this point, most of the consideration is not about expanding the physical infrastructure through the environmentally sensitive area of the Yolo Basin. And that, uh, that, that, uh, that's a pretty important aspect. Anything that we do in that habitat area is, is, uh, is, is uh, very, very dicey. And so, uh, we're looking at all kinds of interesting challenges for fish and fowl and rice growers and all kinds of things happening out in, the, in that area. So you're being very mindful of that, using the existing infrastructure to, to, uh, to try to make things work. So this, uh, sometimes these things are, it takes longer to plan them than, than uh, you know, technology goes beyond us in the time that we're planning and building. So we want to be able to do this once and do it right and we're all gonna be participating in it. And uh, we'll have uh, ongoing commitment to the partnership that we've got. And I, I truly appreciate the comments that the board has raised uh, tonight. And I, I think it gives us some insight and some topics that we need to take some, pay some attention to as we move forward. So Autumn, do you have anything else to conclude? Nothing for me, Chair Sailor. Just to, to, to thank Noeed for taking the time. Very good. I think this brings us to, uh, oh, I, well, before we move to the next item, uh, Mr. Ledesma was unable to, uh, he had a computer issue on item six. Uh, Hope, I'd like to be able to let um, Mr. Ledesma make a comment and if he uh, would like to be included on the vote, allow him to do that. Can we do that? Uh, sure. All right. Chris? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just a quick note to thank uh, both the YPD staff, Autumn, your team, Kristen, and then also the city city team uh, for coming together and a better solution for the city. And just wanted to register my vote as an eye on that project. Thank you. Okay, 
So glad, so noted. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, Hope, for Hope, for your advice on that. Sure. And that that brings us then to item eight. Oh, Tom, did you have something that you? I just want to mention that I, I was struggling to get on from five minutes to seven until about seven twelve when I finally made it on. So I'm I'm not recorded as present during that time, but I was in the wings trying to get there. So I support okay. the actions taken by my colleagues. All right, very good. Very well, you know, I was going to keep you off the whole meeting, but I got busy and distracted and couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Thanks, Don. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, item eight. Thank you, Tom, for that. Item eight is the, is a, I'm really excited about this, this uh, topic and uh, direct our, uh, our executive officer, uh, Autumn Bernstein, working with the, with the entire YCTD team has come up with a, a very interesting and, and a set of goals, I think very ambitious work plan. So Autumn, do you wanna kick this off? I will, uh, thanks Chair Saylor. And, and I'll ask Jose to make me a panelist so I can share my screen here in just a minute. Um, but I'm excited about this item too. Uh, as much as we've got a lot of other really interesting stuff on the agenda tonight, this is for me perhaps the one that's been the most fun. Um, this has been really a bottoms up collaborative process with everyone on staff, including our outstanding interns, some of whom are here tonight, putting pen to paper to prepare a first draft of this. And then we all met individually. I met, got, had a chance to meet one on one with everyone as we went through this process, which was great to just understand more about, you know, the work that they do and, um, and that what you know what they're excited about and how they want to help move the organization forward. So we did that and met with everyone, pulled you know pulled together all of their ideas that are, collected their ideas that they'd written down. Then we had a ninety minute workshop where we all broke into teams to synthesize all these ideas into the set of eleven high level goals um, that you have before you. Um, and so I'm excited to present this for you tonight and get your feedback. And I know there's a lot of detail <laughs> in the packet. Believe it or not, this is like actually a distillation. It was like so much more detail. Um, and so getting it down to the amount of detail that we have was, um, was my big challenge. But I also want to say, so this, you know, this is not a work plan. It's not comprehensive. Um, so there are a lot of day-to-day -day operational tasks and recurring activities that we just do in the course of our jobs. And for some of our staff, that's like 90% of their job. So that level of detail, we envision, you know, we envision in individual work plans. But for this, we wanted to look beyond the day-to-day -day and identify like what is it we want to accomplish or improve or change over the coming year. So it is a really ambitious plan. There's a lot in there, but you know, my kind of philosophy is I'd rather you know aim high uh, and get as far as we can um, rather than aim too low and uh, you know and constrain ourselves um, by our you know with a lack of imagination. So. Um, as I go through this, uh, I want you to keep in mind the following questions. Um, you know, is there anything missing or anything that just doesn't rise enough that should be a higher priority than is reflected here? Um, are there particular goals that ought to be prioritized? Um, is there anything that should be deprioritized? Um, and then think about how you would like staff to, uh, to report on progress, how you want to use these throughout the year, you know, as we go forward to kind of manage and, and direct you know, my work in particular as, as your new executive director, um, you know, but the organization overall. So I'm not going to go through all the pages in detail because I don't want to do that to any of us, but I am going to share my screen um, and I've put together just two slides that summarize um, the main goals. And let's see, are, are you all able to see that? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. So, um, so what we have here, the, the first page is the first seven goals. Oh, excuse me, first six goals. There's a, apologies, there's a typo. Um, and I'll just walk through, I'll just give you just a little bit of flavor of each one uh, by giving you a kind of a sampling of the three, six and 12 month goals that we have for each. So the first is to stabilize and strengthen transit operations and management. Obviously this is an issue that's always important, but it's especially <laughs> has really risen to the surface in my first six weeks on the job. So in three months, we want to, in, within the first three months, we want to approve a plan to increase driver wages, hopefully sooner than three months. Um, in six months, we want to do a comprehensive review of our operations contract. And uh, in 12 months, we want to have no delayed missed or suspended services because we've been able to bring everything back online. 
So that's our first big goal. Our second goal is successful implementation of the Yolo Go fixed route service changes. So within three months, we want to implement the West Sacramento service changes. Within six months, the Route 42 service changes as driver resources allow. You see, we've kind of flip-flopped them, right? Because we can do the West Sac changes. We don't need more drivers for that, but it's going to take, you know, it's going to take more drivers to do the improvements to Route 42, which is why we're not, I've sort of flip-flopped those here. And then uh, in 12 months, full implementation of all of our fixed route service changes. Number three is microtransit. So uh, yeah, as we were going into this, we were really recognizing that the, 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 woodland, uh, the woodland service planning is, is, the, is a key priority for us, but more broadly, we really wanna think about what is our strategy and our vision for microtransit district wide and use this project as an opportunity to help us have that deeper conversation. So within three months, we wanna to bring to you a district wide guiding vision for microtransit. What is it we're trying to do as a district for microtransit? Within three months, we want to have selected a vendor for the Woodland Microtransit Project. And within 12 months, have adopted a plan that we can move forward to roll out that microtransit service in Woodland. Goal four uh, is around grant administration. Um, this is adding capacity, catching up and improving our systems. We, uh, particularly as we're taking on this large new infra grant, but really even with just our given um, given volume of work and grants that we manage and engage with, we just have a lot of work to do. So we've got a new hire in the works. Um, we've got that position open right now. We're hoping to fill it and then have be up to date with all of our grant applications and report reporting within six months, um, and then establish new grant invoicing and reporting protocols within 12 months so that we are kind of having a better system for, for, for tracking and staying on top of all of our grant invoicing and reporting. Um, number five is up around updating our finance policies and procedures. Um, so we have a kind of a long list. If you look in the documents, there's a long list of policies and procedures that we want to update. I've just highlighted a few here, a budget reserve policy within three months. Within six months, we want to have a new procurement policy and new financial management software for particular things. And within 12 months, we want to have completely transitioned to a new, new payroll procedures and software. And then uh, number six here, which is misidentified as number seven, um, is around, this is around capital improvements. We need a 10 year capital improvement plan to guide our investments in cap capital projects for the next 10 years. As part of that, we need a zero emission fleet plan, which is mandated by the Air Resources Board. Um, and then we have some time sensitive improvements uh, to capital, capital improvements that we need to make. And these are time sensitive either because of grant funding that's about to you know, run out or because like we need to replace our skylights because they're leaking and we don't want to go through another winter with them. Um, so within three months, uh, oh, I apologize. This is a typo. Um, we've got, I've got the wrong information here. I, I do apologize for that. Um, but within three months, we have some near-term capital improvements that we want to make here, um, here at, the, at the facility. Um, within six months, we, we want to be moving on our zero emission fleet plan. Uh, and then within 12 months, we want to have completed that zero emission fleet plan and started work on our 10-year capital improvement plan because one kind of does feed into the other. And I apologize, that's not reflected on the slide. So um, moving on to the, the second slide, just the remaining goals. Um, we have a, 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 a goal around multimodal planning for, for transit, active transportation and managed lanes. And this is kind of a broad category and doesn't reflect everything that's in here, but on the active transportation front, we want to hire our senior level. The trail. slide the slide has not advanced, Autumn. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you okay. for letting me know. Let's see. I, I realize that I apologize. There we go. Get now? Yep. Okay. Yep. Great. So we want to hire a senior level trails and multimodal planner this fall. We want to adopt a bike trails vision and list of prioritized projects within six months. And then ideally, assuming that we are we, we win the raise grant that we've applied for, we want to be planning and engineering for our three priority projects uh, by the end of the year. Our next goal is around improving customer service by having updated tools, materials, technology, and policies. Uh, we've got a new website in the works, um, which I hope is going to be ready to launch before six months. However, we're gonna be making so many service changes. Uh, I wanted to throw this in the six month category because there's a bunch of new information that's gonna be coming out uh, concurrently with the website with regard to all of our various services that we're changing. And then within a year, we want to launch a system-wide service map, both online and in print. And there's a, a host of other things that are also in this category as well. Just wanted to highlight a few. 
And then our next goal is around rebranding YCTD as a multimodal partner and convener. Uh, and this is really looking at how we partner with different um, agencies, um, both government agencies, but also nonprofits, social service providers who serve that, you know, who really are the, the backbone of providing services that, that our core riders need. So we want to, in the near term, do an analysis of partnership opportunities, you know, kind of mapping the different partners here in Yolo County that we can, we can and should be working with. We want to then do surveys with partners we've worked with a lot, interviews and meet and greets with those who we don't know as well or don't work as off with as often as we could to better understand how we're an, an effective partner with them. And then within 12 months, come back with a set of recommendations for you all regarding that. You lost your slide, uh, Autumn. Oh, I'm so sorry. I think control, control R might get you back. I don't know. Thank you. I apologize. Let's see if I can get my technology back here. Try that again. Are you seeing it now? It's, uh, it's starting. It's not there yet. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Getting used to this new computer. So um, I was just wrapping up number 10. Number 11, improving data-driven data decision-making. Um, we want to identify opportunities to improve our data quality. Uh, within six months, we want to launch a new data dashboard um, and then with, within the year, we want to have that something that is updated monthly for both internal and external use that's providing a snapshot, not just of YCTD's transit service, but also looking more broadly at mobility and transportation uh, within our county and understanding, particularly as we're coming out of COVID with so much change that's happening in terms of how we get around. We want to make sure we're really keeping tabs on what's going on out there in our community with their travel needs so that we're making the best decisions um, as we can, both about our services and how we can support our partner agencies. And then lastly, for the YCTD staff team, we wanna clarify our structure. We wanna establish pathways for growth and create a culture of mutual respect. Um, so again, there's a lot in the plan, but just a sampling here. Uh, within three months, we wanna have all of our open positions filled and have an updated staffing structure. Within six months, we want all staff to have up-to-date job descriptions and work plans. And within 12 months, we want all staff to have a complete and annual performance evaluation uh, that identifies you know, pathways for professional development, um, both within the organization and, and for skill development. So I will stop sharing my screen now uh, and just reiterate the thank you for, for, for listening. I know it's a lot of information uh, and I would welcome your, your questions, your comments uh, you know, around what we're prioritizing and really looking forward to your feedback um, on how we make sure we are focusing our efforts in the right ways uh, as we go forward. Well, I'll just make a, a comment, Autumn, that this, the team has really developed a robust uh, framework for action. I think your work plans that'll flow from this are really remarkable. This is going to be a very, uh, a very powerful um, set of activities that you're going to be addressing together. Uh, I think that your your encapsulation of the of the uh, eleven elements in the in the highlights uh, leaves out a, a number of them that are that are buried in. But I think you did a good job of, of kind of identifying the strands that are most critical. And I, I'm, I am confident that the other pieces will feed into the achievement of the ones that you selected to highlight for us. Uh, so I think that you're asking us for, and we want to congratulate the, the team for coming together in such short order with this framework. And I think it, for me, it captures and the work and that we've been talking about for, for a while and resonates. I recognize many of the themes that you've captured here and really appreciate that. Uh, so uh, I, I'm looking forward to hearing from the board and then I'll make, might make some more comments depending on, on uh, how that unfolds. Uh, any comments? And this is, uh, I think, is this, a, this is input. We're not necessarily taking action, but we're providing our sense, our response to Autumn and of course, it may well bring us to identifying her high priority uh, 
annual performance goals as well. So this is a first step in that process as well. So uh, colleagues, uh, would uh, would any of you like to lead off? Uh, Jesse, do you, you would like it. it? What's that? Tom says he likes it. Okay. Well, I like it. I think you kind of, it's, a, it's simple, straightforward. I like it. Thank you. As often as the case, we we both say the same thing, just say it in different or different lengths of phrasing. <laughs> so good, good job, Tom. <laughs> All right, uh, Jesse, did you have anything you'd like to comment on? I like it, and I like how organized it is. I also think that you could. You and the staff can give each other grace to know that sometimes there'll be opportunities that go out of order on that from three, six to 12 months and just give yourself the grace to, to um, address it. And then um, I just want to say that outside of YCTD and um, the other things that, that um, I'm doing and I think that Lucas is doing is that we're working in different deliberative bodies with equity questions. And I just think that having some... Um, equity for equity questions for um, the deliberative process and organizations is something that you know we could we could have and um, they're very simple just a couple and um, I think they could be used over and over again and they'll still be meaningful thank you for all your great work staff thank you Jesse good points Lucas yeah, uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. I, so similar uh, at joining the chorus, I, I also appreciate your um, that we've presented to us and I like it as well. Uh, a couple of quick comments. Um, you only listed uh, 11 uh, goals. So I'm curious what you're going to be doing in the 12th month. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> sure, we'll think of something. <laughs> you can you can ruminate on that a little bit if you want to get back to me on that. All right. I'll um, <laughs> no, um, but. Uh, now, all kidding aside, um, I do think uh, I recognize that they may not explicitly all be in order of prioritization, but I, at the same time, I, and, and some of them clearly are. So number one, as an example, um, and number two, I mean, I, I totally recognize like, and I agree that those are, I would say the top two priorities, short-term and medium and long-term. <laughs> um, uh, those are would be the top items. So it's, I'm glad to see that that's where they've sort of fallen in the I know they're not, it's not explicitly a ranking. So, but I do appreciate that. Um, Probably do, an unconscious ranking. <laughs> right. Well, I do <laughs> think to Jesse's comments about equity, I mean, I definitely agree with that. And I think that's why I would, I would actually say as well that the um, item 11, which because it's not explicitly ranked, I would actually probably advocate for <laughs> 11 to be boosted a little bit higher um, to make it look like it's maybe more important and not the <laughs> an afterthought, uh, uh, you know, fostering a, a culture of mutual respect and, you know, pathways for growth and, and team structure and things like that, I think is very, very important, um, especially since there are uh, this new dynamic of you as executive director and um, we've had some, you know, changing over of staff and such. So I think that there's, um, not that, again, I know that's not, it, uh, I know that it's not explicitly ranked, but if it's, it, if it's not explicitly ranked, then it probably shouldn't be number 11. <laughs> In my opinion, I feel like it needs it, is deserving of a little bit, uh, higher priority up the, uh, up the ladder a bit. So anyway, I um, appreciate all of this work and uh, I think you're on the right path and, um, and there's never a dull moment. That's for sure. So appreciate all your, all of you as staff, all your hard work. Thank you. Chris, are you, uh, you, you have comments? Yeah, no, just uh, appreciate the thoughtful um, layering of all the different priorities. Um, I think in the first 40 days, is that what it is? Uh, thereabouts, uh, you, you cer certainly, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, you certainly grasped uh, the work ahead and being able to, to concisely put it together so that Staff clearly sees a path. We see a path. I think we're all aligned. Um, that, that's that's the most probably the most important thing. So to the staff, thanks for for kind of clearing this. this is probably one of the more um, kind of clear outlines of the work streams you'll have all year that I've seen in the time I've been on YCTD, and I'm sure that's helpful to all of you. It helps. It helps me as a board member to be understand that that you guys are I think are all working on on the same things and um, unlike Jesse and, and Lucas you know the equity thing can can be 
tricky, but it can be simple. And, and the way I like to think about it, and, and it should be strewn through with everything we do, right? Um, I never see it as a as a one kind of goal that fits in. It's 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 an additional lens to everything we do, and and an outcome that we know we've crossed the right uh, bridges, or or we've 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 engaged the right and and everybody. So. Um, I think it's just a lens. It's part of our values that we had. That's probably more important than it is to kind of have it in our goal. It's got to be coming from us. So I uh, appreciate the comments from my colleagues on that. Uh, more so seeing staff kind of take to some of the things we've been talking about, including equity over the last uh, 12, 24 months. So anyway, thank you. Good work. Love it. Thanks, Chris. Matt, do you have any comments? I would, I would just want to appreciate um how extensive and comprehensive the list is. And note, because um, I'm realizing there's going to be a lot of work ahead of us for the board to look at these proposals and ideas and recommendations and studies. So I really appreciate um, the work that's going to go into this. Um, I know I struggle sometimes on this board with um, options and analysis and always looking for context of what do other transit agencies do? How was a um, particular decision presented to the board with enough information to have a perspective and know, you know, what's the, is there an action, a no action alternative if we do nothing compared to the proposal, compared to a different option? Um, and a lot of these I think could benefit from that kind of context as they come forward. But um, otherwise, it's really impressive and um, really, I appreciate it. So thank you. Thanks, Matt. Alex, so Padilla, do you, do you have anything you'd like to add? I just wanted to say thanks. I'm really excited, excited to be part of this board and um, looks like you guys have some ambitious goals and I'm um, happy to help and assist in any way possible. Thank you very much. Well, Autumn, I think, did you get what you need, do you think? You yeah, I think so. I think um, our next steps on this are to uh, to take this, and I think um, I think we have one more go around internally uh, to make sure everything makes sense, um, and then to uh, to then take it to the next step, which is to inc start incorporating this into our work plan and thinking about the vision of labor, both with our existing staff and with the new positions, um, to make sure we have a clear sense of you know of who's doing what and. Um, and so I look forward to coming back to the board with, I don't know if we want to say like quarterly updates where we touch base on kind of where progress is being made. We can, we can talk about that offline. Um, but yes, uh, yeah, I, I really want this to be a living document and something that we can just keep coming back to and refining as we go forward. Um, and like I say, it's been, it's been, it's been a great process to, to just do it. Um, and so looking forward to, you know, seeing, seeing how far we get <laughs> with all of it. <laughs> Well, thank you. I think you, you've heard the, the board's very excited and the, the work that you all have done with resonating with us. It, you know, we're, we're with you. Great. Okay. So that brings us uh, to item nine, which is the SAC RT uh, temporarily op temporary operation of the Causeway Connect service. And we, we should have probably mentioned there was a two by two with the Two members of our board, Director Ledesma and myself, and two members of the RT board, and, and, and the teams uh, about two weeks ago, and uh, a lot of what your some of these things did come up in that conversation. It was focused on this one topic mostly. So, and I'm going to let Jose take the lead on this one. Okay. Uh, thank you, Autumn, and thank you, um, Chair Saylor. Um, so this item. Um, formulated as part of um, you know, the outcome of that uh, two by two conversation and in meeting and discussion, as well as some um, following conversations we had, um, Autumn and I with the Sacramento Regional Transit team. Um, but in brief, uh, the original recommendation was to authorize uh, our uh, Autumn as our executive director to uh, um, enter into an, an amendment of an existing MOU uh, between the Causa Connection Partners, which is YCTD, Sacramento Regional Transit um, and the University of uh, California at Davis. Um, and the reason behind the original request um, for that amendment 
uh, stemmed from uh, one of the impacts of our recent driver shortages. Um, YCTD staff basically turned over every rock possible and began investigating um, all, all reasonable options to try and uh, mitigate that driver shortage, uh, which included contacting our partner, uh, Sacramento Regional Transit, and asking them if they had any capacity uh, it, it, with respect to drivers uh, and vehicles in order to um, alleviate our own shortages. Uh, and in those conversations, uh, it was expressed that it was a potential option. Um, the conversations develop um, a public meeting of the, the, the two by two, as mentioned by uh, Chair Saylor, occurred um, a couple of weeks prior to the development of this item. Um, but that conversation and the feedback received did inform um, kind of the original intent of uh, this report um, and request uh, recommendation, I should say, to um, consider granting authority to our executive director. Um, originally, the intent behind the amendment would, was focused on um, a transition of operations, uh, meaning um, currently the Causa Connection is operated jointly by YCTD's team um, and Sacramento Regional Transit's team. The request was a consideration of having Sacramento Regional Transit take over um, complete operations of the service temporarily. Um, in order to, again, alleviate our own driver shortages and uh, potentially allowing our district to uh, expand our Route 42 sooner than, um, as soon as possible. That was one of the key goals. So we wanted to make sure that we, um, you know, if that was an option, be able to uh, result in some um, immediate benefits to our district and to our customers. Uh, and so, again, that was the original uh, kind of aim. Um, since those conversations, um, Sacramento Regional Transit led the uh, development of a draft uh, amendment to that existing MOU, and there were some items that were presented in that draft that, um, for lack of a better phrase, kind of caught our team by surprise um, that had not been considered or mentioned during uh, previous conversations. And so um, I just want to express that we want to, we as a district, as a, as a partner to this, um, want to make sure that any amendments uh, that are considered are mutually beneficial to all of the partners, um, YCTD, Sacramento Regional Transit, and the university. And we wanna make sure that all of the partners have um, equal consideration uh, of any amendments. And so um, that is where we are currently in the, in the conversations. Um, there was not, at the time of the um, development of this board packet, uh, the draft amendment was not available, which is why we didn't include it um, as part of it, or the primary reason we did receive that draft after this uh, publishing of our packet. Um, but as I, as I mentioned, there were some items in there that kind of gave us a little bit of pause. Um, conversations continued. And I believe Autumn has also had um, additional conversations with uh, Sacramento Regional Transit's team, as well as um, uh, uh, other members of the, of the partnership. Um, and so that being said, um, we are continuing the conversations. We are continuing to closely work with our partners um, to develop an amendment uh, because, again, it is our intent to um, identify all of those resources available so that we can proceed with the implementation of our prioritized services, uh, including the expansion of the Route 42 uh, and other uh, service changes that would be a benefit to our district and our customers. Um, but we are not going to do it at the expense of um, our own district's available resources, not just drivers, but uh, funding and or vehicles. Um, and uh, beyond that, I, am I would be happy to clarify or elaborate on any of the um, topics discussed, some of the operational concerns that we have already kind of considered um, and potential timing of implementation um, based on, again, mutual conversations. Um, but as it stands right now, um, we do not have a uh, say a final draft of an amendment to present at this time, it is being developed um, and we'll make sure that whatever gets presented uh, is again, acceptable and beneficial to all of the partners involved. And Autumn, I apologize, if there's anything else that um, you wanted to elaborate on or if I can clarify any of those topics to the board, I'd be happy to do so. Okay. I'll just add that I'm hopeful that it'll work out. Um, but again, you know, I, I would say we don't, we're, at this moment, we still have a lot of issues to work through to get there. All right, and uh, would you like, uh, I think your ask of us, your recommendation is that we authorize uh, the executive director to prepare and execute an amendment if it's mutually acceptable and it achieves the, the interest that you outlined in Jose's presentation. That's your, that's your recommendation. That's right. Okay. All right, uh, colleagues. The okay, there's a motion from Mr. Stallard. Is there a second? Second by Ferks. Oh, I'm sorry, Jess, I didn't, I, I, and we'll have some comment time as well. So we have- I, a... I 
I'm happy to second, but um, do we take public comment on this? We, we will before oh. we take a, before we vote on the motion. Yes, thank you. So we have a motion from Staller and a second from Frerix, and, uh, and we will ask for public comment. Is there any public comment? Anybody requesting to address us on this topic? We do not have any requests at this time. Okay. Is there any further comment on the motion on the table? Mr. Chair, it's, it's uh, uh, Chris. Just just a quick comment, and, and to Autumn and Jose, I know, appreciate you following up on some of the uh, issues you kind of laid out, and uh, frankly, keeping an eye on uh, sort of making sure uh, we have an equitable agreement between us and Socrates. So um, I, I fully support this, and and um, uh, just want to appreciate. Uh, just want to say I appreciate the work and the diligence. I know uh, Mr. Saylor and I. Uh, we, we, thought, we thought we had a good discussion with them um, uh, when we met a couple of weeks ago. But I think we did, uh, Mr. Chair, commit that we would get back together um, so, sometime relatively soon. And um, so uh, I, outside of this, I would appreciate kind of to the entire board to make sure whatever agreement comes up, um, we do get a briefing on those issues. So anyway, but thank you. And I, I do support this. Very good. And yeah, we'll... I, I think we, in the interest of time, it's a good motion to, it's a good thing carried out and then issues that need, that we should bring it back to the board, not before the action is taken, but for information on, on the status update. And then uh, of course, uh, we'll, uh, Chris and I will continue to be available on this topic. So with that, is there, we have a motion, uh, I think Stallard and second by Frerix, would you please call roll? City of Davis. Aye. City of West Sacramento. Aye. City of Winters. Aye. City of Woodland. Aye. Yolo County. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Very, very interesting uh, opportunity to partner uh, is uh, what comes out of this. Item 10, Autumn is your executive director report. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, thank you all for, for hanging with us. I know we've got a very rich and had a very rich and full agenda tonight. And we are, uh, we have to do a couple of important things we want to touch upon. First, of course, is that as you've noticed, we did not have an agenda item about our driver shortage and uh, potential wage increase. And that isn't because we haven't been working on it and thinking about it. So I wanted to just share a brief update. And then I've also invited Michael Klein from TransDev, who's here. Um, who's been graciously sitting through all this other stuff <laughs> uh, to give a brief, brief update from his perspective. Um, and then we have a couple other items I'll, I'll just touch on very quickly. So, uh, so you know, TransDev is continuing efforts to recruit, hire, and train new drivers, as I'm sure Michael will tell you. We've been receiving re weekly reports on the number of applicants and, you know, how it's going. Uh, but again, it does take time. Once somebody is hired, then they need to go through training, and only about half of them actually make it through training and come on board. So, we are holding steady at about 52 operators, uh, and with that, we are meeting all of our published service. Uh, we are not experiencing any um, uh, any lack of uh, lack of service or disruptions based on our drivers. So we're really happy that I feel like we've been able to right size of our service at a point where we are we are holding we are holding steady. Um, and we've initiated conversations with TransDev about, uh, about a potential wage increase. Um, those conversations are continuing. We had a great talk last week. We're meeting again tomorrow to, to keep working on that. So we do hope to have a, a proposal for you um, at the November board meeting. Um, you know, we're also thinking about, of course, about how we would pay for a wage increase and what the financial implications of that would be. And we want to make sure whatever we bring to you, we make it, you know, we have a, a clear understanding of what exactly is it going to cost? You know, we're, we're lucky in that we do have one-time recovery funds that we think could help cover the cost of this for some amount of time, but then, you know, eventually uh, those funds will run out. So uh, when we bring a proposal to you in November, we hope to both bring up a, a proposal for the wage increase and then also a plan for how we would pay for it and what the financial implications of that would be. Um, so I will stop there and uh, turn it over to Michael to, to share an update on his end. Good evening, Chair Saylor and members of the board. I really, you covered most of it all on them. Um, I wanted to just kind of give an idea on where we're at as far as recruiting efforts. Um, Autumn did mention about the numbers that are giving, uh, that we're getting every week. Just an idea back to about the last five weeks, we've 
scheduled about 46 interviews. Out of that, we've had 21 no call, no shows, meaning we do pre-screening and they agree they are gonna come and do it for interviews. 21 do not show up. Um, out of that, we've uh, had nine that accepted. We have three still in training. Six have been disqualified through training and 11 um, were declined due to conflicts with schedule and the type of work once they got more information on you know, working with the public, things like that. And then again, we had another six that declined um, through interview just because of the wages. So we did have many more applicants that were pre-screened online uh, or say through a phone call and they just, most of them were due to wages and then back again, they were, they were asked about schedules. So it's, it's been a lot, 46 interviews is quite a bit to, to set up, um, even with having the, um, say 20, you know, 25 that's actually came through. Uh, we're still pushing, looking under every rock as mentioned before to find the applicants that will come in and we're working on doing other efforts as far as to help with training. Uh, some have gotten out of the six were disqualified was for different reasons of not being able to make it through the initial training of getting the licensing. So we're working on doing extra efforts to get them prepared as well and not get discouraged through that. And that's all I have. You're, you're yeah. muted. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so I want to uh, I, I, I want to touch on a couple of other items, but before I do, I just want to see if there's any questions um, for for either Mike or myself before we move on with the final items in the executive director's report. So you're continuing to work together on this, and perhaps we'll have a, an update and ideas to move forward in responsible manner and and address this problem. Okay. okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. All right, um, the final thing I just wanted to share uh, is some very interesting numbers. Um, I'm actually gonna share my screen again, hopefully it'll go better this time, <laughs> on our ridership because it's been a very interesting time um, for our ridership. Uh, we have, as you know, uh, school started again in Davis and it's been a really interesting to see what's happened with our service. So this is showing you July is in orange, August is in blue, and September is in green. And remember, school started at September 22nd. So this is only one week of school uh, you know, with the classes at UC Davis being underway. And you can see this jump um, in our ridership quite dramatic from 40,000 to about 54,000. That's on fixed route. And then we have the paratransit and the microtransit here. But on this next slide, um, we go into a bit more detail on that. So you can see this is the Route 42. So what we see is Route 42 went from about 14,000 riders in August to close to 20,000 riders in September. Again, just with school being back in for just one week. Uh, and that's on the hourly, our hourly headways, yeah. And then um, on the 138, which is the Cache Creek, um, we see a jump in ridership there as well. And then of course the L line and the A line. Again, this is just one week. We carried 6,600 people um, on, the, on the A line and 2,000 people on the L line. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's just really, uh, as we continue again to recover from COVID and as more and more institutions reopen, we wanna just keep um, you know, keep tabs on what's happening out there and, and sharing that info for you. So as we think about, hopefully once we start getting more drivers on board and restoring um, some of our service cuts and moving forward with the Route 42, thinking about how we prioritize those resources to make the best use of them to really meet the riders where they are. So um, that's all I wanted to share on that. And there's a couple other items in the executive director's report that I'm not gonna to touch on verbally, but I'm happy to answer any questions about them if you have any. Thank you, very, very interesting stuff. Any questions on any of the other items in the, or the any of these you've heard or any other item? I don't, I don't see any, thank you. Thank you everybody. This has been a fantastic meeting. I, I'd really appreciate the hard work that everybody put into it and the, and the diligence uh, throughout the meeting as well. I think we're done, are we not? Okay, so we'll, we'll adjourn and our next meeting will be November 8th, same time, same bat channel. So thank you everybody, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Good night all. Bye. Good night.